All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Living the Dream podcast. And today on the show, we have Hans Hagemann. How'd you like that? You got that right, Timmy. Thank you. Awesome. Sounds good. And Hans is going to get to tell us a little bit about himself, his dreams, and just his life and the amazing things that he's been able to do. And so, Hans, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. It's, it's, it's been a productive, uh, peaceful day, so I'm happy. Awesome. Awesome. That sounds good. And so we like to jump right in. And if you could just start with telling us, you know, a little bit about yourself and some of the stuff you like to do for fun. Well, I'll start with the stuff I like to do for fun because the other part is a little bit longer. But the stuff I like to do for fun, I, I like calisthenics. I like hiking. I like growing vegetables and I like reading. And, okay. and so a little bit of, a little bit about myself. I'm actually living in a fairly rural area in uh, the Hudson Valley of New York State. But I grew up in a section of New York City called uh, Harlem and then East Harlem and grew up there in a, a residential drug treatment center that my uh, father had started and where uh, my housemates were 50 men who were Vietnam veterans or who had been released from prison and were uh, fighting to become new people after, after drug addiction. And I saw my mother and father uh, help them fight those battles and... Uh, during the day, I would go to an elite private school. And so I had a kind of a schizophrenic existence where I was going to school with people like John F. Kennedy Jr. and, uh, you know, the masters of the universe and then coming home at night to uh, scenes of poverty and people trying to uh, find redemption. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so you lived in the place with the veterans that were trying to, like, get back on track in life and stuff? Yeah, I, at the age of 10 and, and so forth, I, I was hearing more stories than I probably should have had. I should have heard about combat in Vietnam or life in prison. <laughs> yep. But it was all part of my education, and I, I, I have no regrets. Awesome, awesome. And what is that? What is it called again? What did you call it? Was it a drug treatment center? Drug, re, residential drug treatment center. So, so people actually lived there, about 50. And then during the day, another 50 men and women would come in for, for therapy and of, of various sorts. Gotcha. I didn't know the people who worked there lived there. That doesn't normally happen, but back then, and maybe I'm aging myself, but back then, that, that's how my family felt that they needed, my parents felt they needed to do it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Love it. Um, awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. And we get to jump into kind of how that shaped you and a little bit about your life. So tell us about your work life up to now, what you're doing now and what you've done. Well, it, and I'll go back. I mean, I was always, because of my parents' example, I was always going to save the world. And I thought the best way to do that would be through the practice of law. So after college, I uh, ended up practicing law for nine years. And they say there are two things you shouldn't see made. One is sausage and the other is law. And I got to see law made working in the United States Senate as chief counsel to a Senate subcommittee. Uh, I was a, I did, I did a little bit of real estate law. So, you know, kind of in your world a little bit. Um, I did, uh, I was a prosecutor and I was a public defender. And throughout that, I, 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 I think I made a difference in individuals' lives, but I wasn't making the impact that I wanted to make. So I eventually decided that I would uh, start a school. And, you know, who knew, who knew that, you know, <laughs> what you need to start a school? And I, I pretended that I did. So, um, I looked around for some money and I figured, look, what's, what's a good investment? And I said, like, I could probably start a school for $50,000. And that number was pulled out of the air. And so I, I had $25,000 from a professional gambler. And the other $25,000 was from John F. Kennedy Jr., um, who went to his foundation that he had just joined, then a fairly new Robin Hood Foundation, and was able to get uh, Another, the other 25,000. So I started and, and I ironically or not, I started in the uh, place that had been the residential drug treatment center after my parents became ill and, and were unable to take care of themselves. They still live there. I started the school in that place. And 23 years later, my brother is still running it, except he now has, I think, a, a $14 million new building. I was running in a place where I was killing rats and cleaning the boilers, then washing up and making breakfast and lunch for the kids, as well as raising money and, and, and teaching class. And I had a contract taken out of my life by the drug dealers on the block because I was interfering with their drug trade uh, because I was running a school. So I carried a gun for part of that time and wore a bulletproof vest for two years. And uh, it was also a time where uh, New York City, there were, I think, 2,500 homicides in New York City. So I'm, I'm lucky to be here talking to you. Absolutely. And, oh, I'm sorry. 
And I see, again, this is how old I am. So after I, I, I did that, then after my brother and I decided that one of us was gonna kill the other one after about nine years, I left him to continue running the school. And uh, I had a plan I was going to start, uh, start a girl's school in India. Don't ask me, well, friends told me about the plight of poor girls in India. Uh, and that, that interested me in, in terms of, of being able to, to make an impact with, with not that much money. And so I eventually did. I, I, I started with some co-founders over in India. I started a small girls' school in India where we educated poor Hindu and Muslim girls. That ran for about 10 years. In the interim, I then ran a, uh, a $14 million nonprofit, uh, youth development nonprofit, where I had 350 employees. Uh, it had been around since 1937 and uh, took over from a revered executive director who died very suddenly after 27 years in leadership there from pancreatic cancer. So there were a lot of challenges with that. Um, as part of my job there, I started a, an independent high school for kids who had not been successful in public high school. And uh, after that, I decided, you know what, <laughs> it's, it's, it's long to me, so I don't know. So eventually I, I left there and my wife and I started uh, a, a physical training uh, business in a brownstone that, that we had. And after that, we ended up moving here to upstate where I have done a couple of things as interim director for a place that took care of primates in Africa um, to, to another place that had after school programming in Kenya. And most recently I ran a, a nonprofit that uh, did garden-based education in 11 schools in the Hudson Valley. And I started a program, yoga, mindfulness and vegetable growing in a, a teen prison for boys who had been convicted in adult court of extremely violent crimes. Uh, did that for uh, a little bit more than a year. COVID hit, had to take some time off, started it back up again. And now um, I'm on my own with both uh, an LLC called Older But Stronger and a nonprofit called Carencia Leadership. Gotcha. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old, Timmy. I don't know. I'm old. I'm old. <laughs> That, that was awesome, honestly. Uh, tell us a little bit about Older But Stronger, and what was the other one called? Cadencia Leadership. Uh, and Cadencia uh, is Q-U-E-R-E-N-C-I-A. Uh, and and there, there are a couple of meanings for it. So one is in, the, in out in the Southwest, it's an area where people feel that this is community. This is where we're safe. I, I adopted the name or, and got the name um, because of, uh, and I can't remember the name, which book now, but uh, an Ernest Hemingway book where Carencia is the area of the bull ring where despite whatever has happened to the bull in a bullfight, that bull knows that, that he's safe in this one space. It, that becomes his home, at least for that moment in time where nothing can touch him. Um, and so that really appealed to me uh, in terms of the young people. And it, it's young people that I'm, I'm working with in terms of leadership. Um, it's around issues of farmer wellness. Uh, it's around issues of, of getting farm farmland for black farmers. So there's that. The um, older but stronger is hopefully will eventually support the currency leadership piece. But I'm working with uh, in the process in its very beginning stages, working with uh, male tech startup founders who want to avoid burnout. And I'm doing that through venture capital firms who, who recognize that uh, you know, if, if one out of 10 of the things that they fund go out of business, the average seed fund or, or series A funding for a, a, one of these startups is $2.2 million. So I'm betting that they can pay me a small portion of that to make sure that um, these, these tech founders engage in self-care because without growth and personal development, you're not going to get business development. So those are the things that I'm juggling right now. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, I think we'll come back around to Older But Stronger and Cadencia Leadership a little bit later in the show. But first, let's hear a little bit about your motivation, what gets you up every day and keeps you going. It, it started back from what I was talking about before in terms of trying to save the world. And, and we, we lived, before we lived in the residential drug treatment center, um, we lived in the housing projects in East Harlem. And I remember, and, and, and at a time back then, um, the housing projects were, were actually fairly diverse. I remember there was a Jewish family just above us and the young man there after the father died, he was 16, he lied to, to uh, be, become a Marine and fight in the Vietnam War. There was a Swedish family. Most of the, most of the family were, were black and Latino, but, but there was more uh, diversity back then. 
And um, my father was a Methodist minister. And I remember on several occasions, there were the Harlem riots in, in 64, um, also after Dr. King was killed. And my father would go out with other pastors to, to, to make sure that the neighborhood uh, didn't burn down. I also remember him, my brother, sister, and I would link arms when we were younger uh, as he was going out the door of the housing, this housing project department because he was going to march yet again with Dr. King. And we knew even as young as we were that he was going to get jailed, probably beaten, and we didn't know what else. So we didn't want him to leave, but he would always laugh and say, you know, just know that I love you if I don't make it. And this, this is stuff he's telling us when we're like, you know, very young. Um, just know that, that, that things will be okay. And um, my mother supported him in that work. She was a teacher who made a lot of difference in a lot of kids' lives. And so for me to do anything other than be of service um, was not, not in the cards for me. And so my top three values are creativity, service, and freedom. Uh, and I've, I'm better, you know, some of those than others, but, but those are the top values. And I try to live those out every day. And so you know, when I get up now and I'm working for myself um, and it's really quiet, around, well, until this past weekend, but that's another story, it was very quiet around here. Um, I, I get up with, 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 with the desire to be, my tagline for my, my personal tagline is to become an ancestor worth claiming, um, could also be an ancestor worth remembering. And so I, I actually have that in, in, in the front of my mind every day when I take on any task. And so I'm working harder now on my own by myself with the help of a daughter um, who lives in the city uh, than, I, than I did you know, when I was going to the offices that I would go to uh, every day because it's on me. I want to leave a legacy. Uh, David Brooks wrote a book, and the journalist David Brooks wrote a book and talked about um, there comes a point where if you're conscious and aware, you want to start living out your, your instead of your resume virtues, you want to start living your uh, eulogy virtues. So again, at my age, I'm thinking about my eulogy virtues and that's what gets me up. Gotcha, gotcha, I love it. The eulogy virtues, nice. Dude, <laughs> I, I love the fact that you um, traced it back to that example that your parents set for you and just the service and you took it to heart. And I also love how clear you are on your core values and that, that one little tagline, that phrase, becoming an ancestor, worth claiming that is like something very simple that you can keep at the top of your head that can yeah. keep you focused keep you motivated and i love that um thank you yeah that's yeah awesome. every, every everything i do I, I measure it against that and there are times where i want to get angry or, or become frustrated and i, I said no, you know what's what's the ultimate outcome you're looking for here and i there, there's a the, the founder of aikido uyashiba um, was was one of his students that you know master we're, we're amazed you're, you're never knocked off balance and he said I'm always off balance but I've trained myself to get back to center faster than you have and so I try to look at it that way as well yeah yeah no awesome I love that um, awesome so let's go ahead and hop into your dreams and goals right now so I know your current projects are older but stronger and cadencia leadership tell us a little bit about your vision for those two well, there are a couple of things. One of the, one of the big projects now, I, I, well, ironically or not, is, is I'm uh, kind of executive producing a podcast that has yet to launch, but will soon called Cultivating Resilience. And what that podcast will do is hopefully uh, address the issue of farmer suicide in this country, which is at a, a much higher rate than, than people realize. And so it's going to be talking to farmers about the stresses involved in, in farming, the people that bring us our food. Uh, but then also searching for ways of, of, of letting other farmers know that there are ways and, and, and paths to wellness. So that, that's taking up a, a big uh, part of my time. Then also, uh, I'm going to be collaborating with a friend of mine who is, has asked me to come into the city to work at several men's shelters and work in areas of anger management. Uh, for the men that come back there. He says, so many of these guys are talented, but they end up right back in the shelters because anger has gotten the best of them. And that anger, uh, in my experience, is, is always undergirded and, and, and the foundation of that is, is fear and shame. And so addressing those issues is something I want to do. 
one of my former students from middle school, you know, more than a couple of decades ago, is actually uh, engaging in uh, a lot of anti-violence initiatives in, in the Bronx, and I'm going to be assisting him with those. Um, I'm also, I'm planning, I've got five acres here, and so I'm planning to um, grow food to, to support pantries in the area. So there, there are a lot of projects that are going to be taking up time, and I've just got to figure out which ones. Oh, I'm so, I also failed to mention, I am a... Um, a breathwork coach. So I've done breathwork training for farmers at Farm Aid uh, through the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network um, with teenage athletes. And I'm looking to get into schools. Uh, the, the US Department of Education just the other day released a report talking about the tremendous challenges around mental health uh, for young people returning to school. And so I, I wanna let young people know that they have agency, that there are means of self-care for them um, and that not all those means of self-care or, or care have to be prescribed by a doctor, that they, they, there are things that they can do for themselves. So those are some of the things that are on board right now. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And so tell us a little bit more about the breath work. I'm curious because I, um, there's this guy, I don't remember his name, but he does like really extreme stuff and is really key on Wim Hof. Wim Hof? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're, it's, 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 it's a burgeoning field, and that's another area that I'm going to be working with teens, uh, particularly uh, teens of color around. I think it's, what is it, it's at least a 12, 14, 15 billion dollar industry, the wellness industry, um, that you see with Gwyneth Paltrow, who actually visited one of my earlier schools, by the way, who runs Goop, um, and some of the other people in the space. Breathwork plays a central role, so I would, I'm going to be hopefully certifying teens at some point in some of these things. As, as well as herbalism and so forth. So yeah, Wim Hof um, is incredible. And, and he, he has a very extreme form of, of, of breath work. It's not for everybody and it should be done under supervision for a variety of reasons. Uh, but then there's, there's holotropic breath, there's, um, there's transformational breath, uh, there's the, the traditional yogic pranayama, uh, there's uh, one of my instructors, uh, Dr. Belisa Vranich, does performance breathing where the physiology, I mean, because we're sitting at these desks, a lot of us all day, where our physiology doesn't lend itself to proper breathing. Um, we take thousands and thousands of 24,000 or something breaths a day, and, and most of those are dysfunctional, and most of those are up here. So being able to release the rib cage, make the diaphragm stronger, breathing from the diaphragm, having a 360 degree cylinder where the breath grows and lives, breathing through the nose. Those are all some of the things that I teach people as well as, as different rates of breath because we have the our, our vagal system. The vagal system talks in Latin, it has something to do with the wandering nerve, comes down from the brain stem and, and extends down through our torso. And we have three different modes we can be in, right? Um, Rest and digest, uh, fight, flight, or freeze is, is another one. And it's fight, fright, fight, <laughs> fright, freeze, or collapse. And that's the, that's the, um, the, the dorsal vagal system. And then there's the ventral vagal system. So, or the sympathetic nervous system. So we can either be sympathetic, fight or flight. We could be rest and digest, uh, which is the ventral vagal, or we can be totally collapsed and, and, and not even knowing that, in fact, we have given up. So getting in touch with your breath through patterns, through breathing in different parts of the body at different rates um, allows us to, to clear up the chatter in our heads and get back more in touch with our bodies. And, and the, there are studies that also show that when you breathe better, you, you gain more of a rhythm and connection with your heart. And, and, and the heart has just as many nerves and makes just as many decisions in, in certain ways as the brain. And so it, it connects us as complete human beings. That's the plan. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love so that. I, I work with the kids at this prison and, and it's not, you know, you try to explain to these boys how the breath works. And they're like, come on, really? But some of the boys get it. They're like, we're going to, some of us, some of them, I had kids who in my, my vegetable gardening program were doing life in prison. They were 14, 15 years old. But, and so some of them like, you know what, I might as well try something. And the ones who actually sit there and do the work notice the transformation and it's reported to me that by the staff that they are there are fewer problems with these kids and so i'd like to bring more of that to, to, to those kinds of institutions as well 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, I guess next we're going to move into your, what caused you to take the first step towards, you know, really pursuing your dream? So earlier you kind of mentioned that you practice law, you were not satisfied with the impact you were making, but tell us a little bit more about that journey, some of the emotions you encountered and how you worked through them. Yeah, I'm probably still working through some of them, but um, when I stopped practicing law, I actually, and started the school, I actually had friends kind of now in quotation marks, who no longer talked to me, who, who gave up our friendship because what are you, what are you, you're starting a what? A, and, and this predates charter school legislation or any of that. Um, and I had been a lawyer. I was a graduate of two Ivy League schools and here I am starting a school. So I had people stop talking to me and I had to make the conscious decision that, that I was going to follow my own path. And, and I continued to do that. And then when the school, we got our 15 minutes of fame at that school, and I met um, Maya Angelou, Oprah Winfrey, a, a number of people just because I you know, was running a successful school, working with kids that other people had given up on. Um, my brother now has a very sizable endowment to run the place. Uh, the former mayor of New York, Bloomberg, came to break ground on the new school building. Um, and, and so then, then I got back in people's good graces again. And when I left that school, I went through the same thing. And it, it became clear to me that I had to walk my own path, that there were going to be only a few people who were going to support me, understood what my values were, respected those values. And, and, and those people ran a span of different uh, incomes and, and races and upbringings, um, but they took the time to knew me, to know me as an individual. They saw the work that I was doing and they let that determine how, how they were going to relate to me. And so it was good to have those few people who believed in me and, and continue to this day to believe in me. I have one friend who um, we met at a gym and uh, he asked me to spot him on the incline bench press. And I'm like, okay. And you know, who was this muscle head and fine. And he asked me where I'd gone to school because we were roughly the same age. And I told him I went to Princeton and he goes, I went to Harvard. And I'm like, you're, you know, I thought he was being funny, but it turns out he did. And he actually was a math major. Um, and he ended up giving me the, my first six figure gift in, in the early nineties for my school. And to this day, he continues to be a funder of the things that I do. And his son is on the board of that last organization that I ran. And so there are people who threw that line they kind of understand. They understand the fact that I'm multi-passionate. They understand the, 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 the fact that I am going to provide service, um, that I am somebody who wants to build community and they honor that and respect that. And so just having those few people in my corner, as well as the kids who I've helped throughout the years, I, I was a big brother in the big brother program at Princeton. Um, I was recently contacted by somebody who um, I was a big brother to in 1978. Um, he was 15. He was at uh, a, a juvenile reformatory, now closed because of the brutality that went on there. Um, and he and I reconnected after 44 years. He, he found me through social media and told me the difference that I made in his life. And so I'm kind of going through a life review these last few years. And that's really what keeps me going because like, there's so many naysayers, so many doubters. And, and you and your mission with this podcast, where you want people to, to live out their dreams, it's so important for people to find that kind of foundation, find that kind of support. And not everybody's dream is going to look the same. So it's, it's great what you're doing to make sure people understand that and to support them in whatever their dream looks like. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate that. It's something that I've always been passionate about and have in the recent years honed in on it and what it actually was. And it's like, I just want people to be their authentic self 24 seven and not feel any type of way about it like not feel like they have to fit into a box and um yeah i love your story well, i wish i wish i wish i had had your house hacking course uh because <laughs> then i would have been able to find it it's my dreams but you know oh well <laughs> <laughs> the house hacking course isn't quite out yet but it will yeah, it is. i know okay all right yeah for sure um yeah. it's definitely a very novel con when i learned about house hacking i was like man this is this is epic but yeah. um yeah. yeah awesome um i guess the next thing I want to ask you is if there were if there was one type of person that you could meet right now that would help you take the next step in your two businesses which were older but stronger and cadencia leadership 
who would that person be and how would they do it? Well, I mentioned I met, I, I met Oprah Winfrey uh, before and, and I'd love to meet her again. And I'd like to tell her what I'm doing now because I think she would get it. Second to Oprah would be, and, and this, there was a person like that in my life. He was a former uh, senior person at McKinsey Consulting and he was on my board at, at the uh, large nonprofit that I ran when I started the high school. And there were board members who said, well, these kids aren't going to Ivy League colleges. Why do we have this high school? Which to me was insane because these kids were becoming um, licensed masseurs, going into the military, starting their own businesses, uh, taking, raising families, taking care of one another. Um, and, and this guy got it. He was conservative, although he denies that he is. And I, I feel more conservative than I am, but, but that's not what he wanted. He wanted people to be their best and that he understood that that best looked different for different people. And he wanted the work of the heart and the hands to be as respected as, as the work of the mind. And so he had issues with credentialism and what people called the meritocracy uh, and, 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 and just wanted people to live their best lives. And he understood that that would look different for different people. And so he's financed several of my initiatives and I'd like to meet somebody like that again and, um, with, with even more money. So. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. And so the type of person that would be ideal is somebody who kind of has the same heart that you do and wants to, you know, help people be their best and make sure that they're valued and can, you know, just understand that process of becoming themselves and also have deep pockets. Yes. Yep. That's the person. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Deep pockets. They're out there. <laughs> oh yeah, they are. Oh yeah, they are. Deep pockets is a big deal. So um, right. right. I love that. I love that. And so what's the most important one or two things that everyday people can do to help you accomplish your goals? Well, like you, I have a course that will hopefully be coming out soon, and it's about peak performance and mindset. And so even something as simple as, as when that course is out, um, you know, joining that course, providing feedback on it is, is, is that kind of thing. Um, I think people getting involved in their communities uh, at, at, at different levels is, is really important. A lot of people have retrenched and community, uh, th th there was a book I came, I can't, this is the 90s, something called Bowling Alone. And that the, the, the scenario that this author laid out where, where people are, are becoming more walled off, not hand, hand, reaching their hands out to other people is becoming more of a trend. And so people looking around, figuring out what can they do in their communities um, it would be really important to me. So those, those are a couple of things. Gotcha. Gotcha. Getting involved in the community at different levels and looking how you can get involved and taking your mindset and peak performance course when it comes out and giving you the feedback and interacting with you on that. When do you think that'll be coming out? The plan is in the next few weeks, actually. I, I have to find the best platform uh, to, to, I mean, with all the things that go into it, whether it's hosting videos or payment processors or <laughs> other stuff, I'm oh, yeah. still going back and forth. And so once that, once that happens, everything will be up and, and, and ready to go. And I, I have a, a link in my, uh, in my information that I sent you, the sleep.bio slash Hans Hageman, where people can find out more, including getting a, a, a free relaxation audio just to get a sample of some of the stuff that's, that's going to happen. Gotcha. Gotcha. I love that. I love that. And so is this your four, first course that you've made? Yes. Yeah. Well, no, I, I actually did a, uh, a body weight calisthenics course that, that's going to be a part of this offering as a bonus. Um, but I did that a couple of years ago and um, I, I'm actually pretty proud of it. Uh, and I think it was, I think it was well produced and filmed. Um, but that was the first course. Gotcha. Gotcha. Love it. Love it. How's the process been for you? Is it like, the actual, is the video the hectic part or is it actual finding all the logistics and stuff? Putting all the, the moving parts together and every time I think I've got it, uh, it's, it's no, the video won't load. You, you, you have to have, it can't be an iframe or a G, JS or, you know, and I'm a baby boomer. So if you're going to start talking to me about CSS and, and, and this, this kind of code is not allowed. And I mean, it's like, come on, slow down. Um, yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's getting all those moving parts, but yes, it is also, I'll figure when I'm going to do the video, oh, I'm not looking my best. And then I realized there's nobody looking for you to be, look your best, you know, you, you, just give them not just information, but provide transformation. And that's, that's good enough. And so that's the plan. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. 
Well, I'll, maybe I'll ask you for some tips when I make my, I'm planning on making three courses, actually. It'll be nice. one, one will be on house hacking. One will be on mm -hmm. always like taking that next step, taking that next first step is how I want to brand it. And then super connectors. I want everybody to kind of be a super connector and yes. be that person that like is always out looking to network, always looking to make connections between one person and another to make things happen. So. Right. Without any, without any desire necessarily for reward to, to make those connections. Right? Exactly. It's just like yeah. the reward you get is seeing other people succeed and be happy and seeing things happen in their life, you know? Right. And then things end up working out for you if that's the mindset you're doing it with. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And so now we're going to jump into our thriving three. And I like to ask people the ways that they thrive with information that they're taking in, how they care for themselves and action they can take right now or continue to take. To get, to get closer and closer to their dreams. So what's your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one. Well, I'm going to pick a, the book. And, and it's in part because I, I, I recommend it and, and give it out to, to people. And it's a short enough read, but it's incredibly impactful. And that's Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and, and I'll leave it at, I'll leave it at that. People should pick that book up. It can be read in a day. Uh, but the things that Viktor Frankl went through and the, and the, and the learnings and the, and the things that he took away from that experience in terms of your circumstances and how you, you, you handle your circumstances and it's not what happens to you, it's how you move through what happens to you that makes the difference um, will, will create, cr should create tremendous change in anybody who reads it in depth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I listened to that book on audio and I was like, this is a book I need to read so I can actually yep. absorb the information a bit better. So I also recommend that one. Um, good, good. What's one way you like to care for yourself? Uh, well, you know, as a, as a certified breathwork coach, I'd be doing myself a disservice if I didn't say breathwork. And I start my day off with both um, of a 10 minute movement routine and a breathwork practice, which takes roughly seven to eight minutes. And then if I have time during the day, I'll do more of it. But yeah, it's it, breath work for me is my meditation. Gotcha. Gotcha. I love it. Um, that is awesome. And what is one action step you can take right now or continue to take to get closer and closer to your dreams? I think it's not being afraid to ask people for help. I've never been incredibly good at it unless there's a lot on the line. But it, on, on a daily basis, uh, I know that there are people who will value the things that I'm trying to do and just asking them for help. And then also something kind of relating to what you were talking about in terms of one of your courses, I think, um, is, is the uh, the WIN acronym, like what's important now, always keeping that in front of my mind and not saying, oh, why is this happening to me as opposed to why is, you know, how is this happening for me and what's important now? What's the next, just the very next step I need to take and maintaining focus on that. And it's going to look different. In, in a lot of different arenas, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I love that. Not being afraid to ask people for help. I've realized that it's such a common theme in all the podcasts I've been recording. It's like, huh. we just need to get out, connect with people and humble ourselves and ask for help because <laughs> yes. people will help, they will believe in us and things will happen. We just right. need to, like go do it and so. If you're, if you're there with pure spirit and, and, and good intentions, yeah, people, people feel that. Exactly, exactly, no. I love it. I love it. So is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? Now, this has been great. I, again, I'm, I'm kind of reclusive up here in the Hudson Valley. And so it's great to speak to somebody uh, like you who's helping people be at their best. And you're allowing me to share a little bit about my journey and path. So this is this has been fantastic. Thank you, Timmy. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, one thing I will say, you mentioned the WIN acronym and just like the focus on the now, like what's next type of mentality. Um, if you haven't read The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it right downstairs, yeah. I love it. <laughs> well, yeah. I have, I, have two, I have 2,000 books in my library. Uh, and so that's, that's going to be a challenge because <laughs> one day I won't be here to take care of them. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got you. No, I feel that. Um, well, awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show, Hans. And if you were listening to this and you vibed with anything he said, and you were able to, one, introduce him to Oprah, which if you can introduce him to Oprah, also introduce me to Oprah. <laughs> but two, also know some people who understand 
um, you know, helping people to become their best selves and have deeper pockets and are willing to, you know, partner with Hans on some of the stuff he is looking to do in the future. Make sure to make that connection. And also be on the lookout for his course. We will put that link in the show notes. Make sure to go to it, connect with him, and just constantly be on the lookout to, you know, help him out in anything he's doing, because that's what we're here for, to help people accomplish their dreams and goals. And finally, thank you so much for being on the show, Hans. Thank you so much for listening, guys. Feel free to like and subscribe on Apple. And the most important thing that we ask you to do is send it to one person that you know needs to hear this podcast. And let's change some lives. And on that note, Hans, thank you again. Thank you, Timmy. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. No, of course. And we're out.